We are live. All right. Welcome, everybody, uh, if you're watching at home, to another installment of Rendezvous with Romance, a partnership between Schuler Books and Avon Books. My name is Amy. I'm a bookseller at the Grand Rapids location of Schuler Books, and I am so excited to be hosting four of my favorite authors tonight uh, in a conversation about their new releases and all things romance. Uh, the titles we're going to talk about tonight and many, many more are available in our stores and also on our website at sugarbooks.com. And we do ship worldwide. So wherever you're tuning in, we'd be happy to send you books or please, please, please check in with your local independent bookstore and find their books there or order them there as well. Uh, without further ado, I'm going to introduce our four guests tonight. Uh, first, I have Jennifer Ryan, who writes suspenseful contemporary romances, uh, deeply emotional love stories filled with high stakes, high drama, love, family, friendship, but always the happily ever after we hope to find. She lives in San Francisco Bay Area with her husband and three children, and when she leaves her fictionally, fictional worlds, you'll find her in the garden playing in the dirt and daydreaming about people who live only in her head until she puts them on paper. Uh, her newest release, which I have right here, is Surrendering to Hunt. It's the second of the Wyoming Wild series in which a by-the-law, by-the-book lawman tangles with a stubborn young woman looking for answers about her missing sister. Welcome, Jennifer. Thank you for being here tonight. Thank you for having me. So happy to be here. Yes, it's a joy. All right. And Sophie Jordan grew up in a tech in the Texas Hill Country, where she wove fantasies of dragons, warriors, and princesses. She's a former high school English teacher and is now the best-selling author of more than 30 novels. She lives in Houston with her family. And when she's not writing, she spends her time overloading on caffeine, lattes preferred, talking plot lines with anyone who will listen, including her kids, and cramming her DVR with anything that has a happily ever after. And her newest novel, which has one of my favorite covers of the year. Amazing. The Amazing. Scoundrel Falls Hard. <laughs> thank you. Uh, is Love the, the third book. <laughs> Everyone, thank, thank you. you. Yes, the third Love book. The I love it too. Bill. It's a marriage of convenience between a fierce female blacksmith and a handsome scoundrel who is uh, about to die at the hands of a mob. So fantastic. Welcome. <laughs> Hi, <laughs> thank you. Good times. All right, Sarah McLean is a lifelong romance reader and wrote her first romance novel on a dare, never looked back again. She is the best-selling author of romances translate, translated into more than 20 languages, a romance columnist and the co-host of the fabulous weekly romance novel podcast, Faded Mates. Uh, she's a graduate of Smith College and Harvard University, lives in New York City. And her second, her book this week is the second in the Hell's Bells series. Last year's bombshell was in my top five reads of the year. And in this one, the Hell's Bells are featured again with the fierce and fearless heroine, uh, Adelaide, who is on a mission to steal a Duke's secrets and possibly also his heart. Thank you, Sarah, for being here. Thanks for having me. And last but not least, the one and only Ms. Beverly Jenkins, who has won numerous awards in all different areas and categories uh, for historical romance. She's been nominated for the NAACP Image Award in Literature, has been featured in documentaries on CBS Sunday Morning and Between the, Love Between the Covers. Since the publication of Night Song in 1994, she's been leading the charge for inclusive multicultural romance and has been a constant darling of reviewers, fans, and peers alike, garnering accolades for her work from the Wall Street Journal, People Magazine, NPR, and many others. And her latest release, another gorgeous cover, is To Catch a Raven. This is the newest in the Women Who Dare series featuring a fearless grifter uh, who goes undercover in a fake marriage to reclaim the stolen Declaration of Independence. Yes, it's the best. It's wonderful. <laughs> Thank you for being here, Ms. Bev, and everybody, this is such a joy. Thanks for having me. Thanks for having me. Yes, so I, of course, have given my tiny itty bitty little blurbs about your new books, but I would love to hear in your words a little bit more about this new release um, and where it falls in its series and sort of what inspired the story. Ms. Bev, would you go first? Okay. Um, it's the it's the third <laughs> the third book in the uh, Women Who Dare series. Um, she is a grifter, um, <clears throat> blackmailed into going undercover in a fake marriage to uh, retrieve a a copy of the Declaration of Independence. 
he is also blackmailed into being her fake husband. And he is, you know, not a grifter. He's like, why am I here? I've never broken the law. I don't want to do this. But they, they wind up uh, in love, of course, and glorious banging and lots of tropes. And I got every trope, <clears throat> you know, you ever want to read about in this book is sort of like gumbo on the page. <laughs> but um, I'm having a had a good time writing it and uh, hope readers will enjoy it. I certainly did. <laughs> uh, Jennifer, what about you? Tell us more about um, the miles. I'm my book, I'm Surrendering to Hunt. I don't know if you can see it, is the second book in the series from Chase's book that came out a little while ago, earlier this year. Um, and they're brothers, of course, the Wyoming Wild series. And Hunt is a lawman who in the first book um, was a little grumpy. <laughs> <laughs> but in this book, <laughs> he's a little grumpy in the beginning because Sin, the woman um, who uh, dislikes him a lot for giving her a lot of speeding tickets and drunk and disorderly while she's out having a good time um, and he's spoiling her fun, but secretly he's, <clears throat> he's really into her um, even though he's trying to keep her on the straight and narrow path. <laughs> Um, and they cross paths a lot because uh, Sin's sister is dating um, Hunt's best best friend, or used to be best friend, until his best friend started um, hitting on his girlfriend. And um, Chase or Hunt was called in to break up the fights and mediate between them. And he just doesn't like what his friend's doing anymore. And Sin really doesn't like the fact that he won't do his job and just put this guy behind bars. But Hunt has to follow the letter of the law and he's not happy about it either um, until Sin's sister goes missing and Sin is on a mission to find her sister before it's too late. And um, she enlists Hunt's help to help her find her sister. And uh, sparks fly, they spend a lot of time together, opposites attract. <laughs> And uh, yeah, and they end up together. <laughs> Very emotionally so, too. Uh, so Very. <laughs> Sophie, tell us a little bit more. Well, like Bev, mine's a book three. <laughs> um, the first book was, it's the first, uh, the Duke Hunt series. So the first book is The Duke Goes Down. And the second book is... The rate gets ravished and now we're at book three and here we are so this is my lady blacksmith book the which of course you know it, it can be read independently they can be read out of order however but the whole idea of the series is all my heroines are working class women in historical romances so book one i had a lady vicar book two i had a lady farmer and this is my lady blacksmith book and i wanted to write a heroine a blacksmith heroine for a really long time. So I finally did. And she's just everything you would imagine. She's very much like a Viking queen. I, I think of her as my Lagatha, you know, my shield maiden. I have to talk about the cover for just a second, guys, because I asked and Avon delivered every ask. You know, I kind of, when you go to cover conference, you have like a wish list and I put everything on it. And they did everything. I love <laughs> so it. I asked for the fiery uh, blah, blah. Why am I blinking out? Oh my gosh. Help me. The forge. Everyone. The forge. forge thank you. <laughs> the fi I asked for a fiery forge. I asked for an anvil. I said, could they be like making out on the anvil? That would be really great. I was like, oh, and maybe like some tools, like some, you know, some props. They even did. I sent like pictures of everything. The anvil, a forge, the tool stand. Maybe it could be outdoors. And she needs to be a big woman, like a large woman. And she certainly is because they almost look comparable in size. But as Sarah yeah. knows, this is Thomas the Boxer. Sarah, you could tell them about Thomas mm -hmm. the Boxer. He's, he's a big dude. Yeah, he's a big guy. I, I've been to a cover, a cover, um, a photo shoot with Thomas yeah. multiple times. And he hugs me now every time. I go because we he's been on a few of my covers and he, like I'm not a small person and he makes Ooh. I feel like a romance heroine when he hugs me I'm like oh I feel like <laughs> for, oh. Sure. <laughs> for sure I mean this is definitely I said this in my event on Tuesday 
This is Sarah McLean right here. Oh, okay? oh I this love it. Very nice. A five love foot it. 11 woman with Thomas the Boxer. Uh, I love it. I love it's it. my scandal in this book. So this is definitely vibing Sarah McLean. Um, yes, I asked I'll for blonde hair. I asked for plates, the, you know, like little braids in the hair. I mean, everything, all the little like poppy things. I was just so excited to have them all. So um, yeah, I'm, as, as um, was mentioned, it begins with, there's an angry mob after him. He's a swindler. He's, a, he's what you would call a con man today. And his father uh, was impersonating the, the new Duke of this village area, Shropshire. So, they, so his dad had been impersonating the Duke. He'd been going along with it, impersonating the Duke's heir and the gig is up and the town is pretty mad. So they're chasing him through the streets and he takes shelter in her shop and one thing leads to another, bing, bang, boom. And suddenly she's pretending to be his love and you can't hang him where we love each other. And they're like, okay, prove it. You're engaged. So, you know, it's one of those, it's full of tropey goodness too. It's got the fake courtship, the fake marriage, forced proximity, um, you know, the more tropes, the better, right, Bev? right exactly, <laughs> there you exactly. Go. yes yes yep. all right and Sarah tell Sarah tell us more about the heartbreaker uh yeah heartbreaker is the second in my hell's bell series the first one was bombshell which was last summer's book um and hell's bells is uh basically I thought to myself well what if I took the marvel universe and I smashed it into a kind of um like vigilante girl gang and I put it in Victorian England what would it look like and here we are so um it is sort of it is um historically inspired in the sense that there was in fact a real life uh girl gang that um called the 40 elephants that existed for about 100 years between Victorian England until into the 1960s um, and I was really excited about them. And I thought, oh, this is great. There's proof in history that this, Bev knows this. Like, you could basically find any idea, <laughs> proof of it in history, if you go looking. And I did. And I did. Um, and the idea was, I'll take this out if I'm going to build essentially like the greatest heist crew ever for this series, each one is going to have to have a very particular set of skills. And so there's, you know, the bombshell or the femme fatale, who's the heroine of the first book. Um, Adelaide is a professional thief. So lots of the theme here seems to be like criminals and women in trouble and women who are yeah. trouble rather. Yeah, right. Um, she's a, she's a <clears throat> professional thief born the daughter of the only child of a kind of king of crime a criminal kingpin in uh the south bank of london um and then there's the explosives expert who's also just chaos she's the next book and then the duchess who is or is uh <laughs> the one with the plan who loves it when a plan comes together for those of you who are a team fans yes, so. yes. yeah <laughs> she's the hannibal huh exactly <laughs> smokes yep. cigars and everything <laughs> love it i love it um so Adelaide, um, when you have a professional thief, like the greatest, you know, pickpocket born on the streets and like one of the greatest pickpockets ever in London, um, you have no choice but to match her with the sternest, most like stick up his ass Duke that you can possibly create. And they have to go on a quest together um, so that it's a road trip romance. There is a shocking lack of beds. They are constantly <laughs> facing an only one bed situation. <laughs> Um, and road trips are really fun in historicals because they come with high women and trouble and justifiably punching bad dudes in the face and also, you know, carriage races and all sorts of fun stuff. Um, and I had a great time writing it because um, I wanted to write something that was wild and fun during a time when I was stuck in my house. Yeah. So here yeah. we go. And interesting to note for other romance fans, you borrowed names of your friends for two of the characters, for the two main characters, correct? I did. Um, Adelaide is Adelaide Frampton, named for my friend Megan Frampton, who writes historical regencies. And the her Duke a couple of, months ago. Yep. Yeah. And the Duke of Claiborne is named for my friend Kate Claiborne, who writes Magnificent Contemporaries. 
yeah. and you should read both of their books too. They're fantastic. Um, so for the others of you, have you ever, or um, how often do you use the names of real people that you know, or friends, family members um, in your novels? I don't, I, no. I no, mm -mm. no, I take mine from uh, the Bible because that's where traditionally black people back in the day pick their kids, pick their names. And from the lists from the um, Freeman's Bureau for the marriages. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and from the backs of the players' uniforms uh, for football and hockey and <laughs> all of that. So, yeah. Nobody I know. Um, I have occasionally, I have a friend mm. that I, um, I think, you know what's interesting? I have a book coming up and I'm using the name Jane twice. Like I used the name Jane in <clears throat> One Night With You, which I wrote so long ago. And now I'm writing historical. Well, I have one coming out next year where she's a secondary character. Like she herself will be getting a book probably in like 2024 or something. But it's funny because I was pausing. I'm like, I'm writing a name again. I've already used, but I'm like, but it's Jane, which has to be one of the most common names in, in English history, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you could throw a rock and hit a Jane. So I feel yeah. like it still feels authentic. And every hot Jane Austen uh, side mm -hmm. character, like every perfect Jane Austen side character is named Jane, which like, yes, look, we should all just name hot side characters after For ourselves. ourselves. <laughs> the prettiest girl, the prettiest girl in the room is going to be named, yes. I love it. Mm -hmm. That's funny. Well, Sophie, just to, to um, say, I just realized today after writing my next book and it being 400 pages long, I realized that I reused the name Summer from a short story I wrote forever ago. And we were talking about it because it's going to be the 10 year anniversary of my first series coming out, my first book coming out. And then I was like, I just reused the name. <laughs> Apparently, I only like, you know, 10 years, I just reuse a name. <laughs> that feels good. right. That feels accurate. That feels right. I know. So I was like, I'm just leaving it because it's a whole well, thing in this book, her name. <laughs> I think we're drawn to certain names, right? Yeah. Does it make sense you'd come back to them in some way? Yeah. 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 And for me, naming characters, I am, um, because I write, you know, in like Montana, Wyoming, so everybody's got kind of, you know, like a, a, a cowboyish name, you know, Luke or whatever. Um, <laughs> Luke or whatever. But I like to get, I, you know, <laughs> what are those cowboy names? I love to get names off of um, the, the movie, you know, scroll of, oh, yeah, you know, all, everybody who's been associated with the movie. I mix and match them. I'm like, yeah. the Grip's first name is really good with the assistant director of whatever. <laughs> yeah. 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 That works. Yeah. <laughs> but I, uh. I think I've used, let's see, I've used two of my kids' names in books. The very first book I ever wrote, the main character is named Jenna, and that was um, my daughter who I was pregnant with at the time when I wrote the book. So it was a little bit of a, this is for you <laughs> kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, and then my um, pen name, Ryan, is actually my middle son's name. Oh, so. I, love it. <laughs> I use it constantly. <laughs> every book, I love it. every book has his name. I'm a middle, he's a middle, my mother was a middle. It's a whole middle child thing in our house. <laughs> a middle, I'm a middle. Um, so what got you into writing romance in the first place? How did you get to here? And me? I um, was an avid reader, I think, like most um, people who write romance. I just devoured romance books for forever um, since I was probably about I don't know. I think my mom introduced me when I was about 19 or 20, I think it was, to Nora Roberts. She um, was like, you know, if you want something to do in your spare time, you should try, you know, read a book, <laughs> as mothers say, <laughs> read a book. So she gave me a bunch of Nora Roberts books and I just devoured them and I loved them. And then I just started, you know, buying every single book. And she, to this day, we still, you know, I'll buy a book, hand it to her. She gets a book, hands it to me. And we've just been doing that. Um, and then um, I was home from work um, 
or off of work because I was pregnant and, um, I just had the story in my head. I, I was the person who would go to sleep at night, like finishing the end of the story. If I hadn't finished the book and like thinking like, all right, what's the author going to do here? Or they, or I'd be disappointed that they went one way. And I'm like, I would have gone this way with it. And so one day I just had a story in my head and was, my husband was out of town for three weeks in China. And I was like, no one will ever know if I can't do it. (laughs) 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 And I started writing the book and I just loved it so much. I was so excited to see the, the words, the thoughts, the, the story all come together on, on the pages and was just like, okay, now what do I do? So I wrote a whole bunch more stories before I was ever published. (laughs) I just kept going and I haven't stopped yet. (laughs) What about the rest of you? What got you into romance writing? The love Um, of a great, mm -hmm. love of a great love story. Mm -hmm. Uh, Even though, uh, you know, at my age, there was nothing in the, on the shelves or in the movies or on TV that, you know, reflected me. But I still loved a good love story. So, and as I've said a thousand times, I had no idea and no plan to be a writer. I just sort of fell in this. And so I'm still falling in this, what, 28 years later. So I'm having a good time. I I mean, I wrote my first one on the, on a dare, like it says in my bio. Um, I worked in, uh, I had always wanted to work in publishing and I did. I was in PR and um, I was a member of like, a, like, a, you know, when you live in New York City and you work in publishing, you know, everybody like you, you are forced to just grow a friend group from all the other people who work in publishing who are your age. And um, we were all out for drinks one night and it was, you know, 2008 <laughs> and, you know, YA was becoming kind of a, a real thing. And I remember I had had just enough alcohol to sort of profess to a bar full of people that I could write one of these. And a friend of mine was like, I dare you. And I went home and I wrote the first chapter of the season that night. And um, the next day I, I, I felt a lot like Jennifer does. Um, I, the next day I was like, Oh my God, that was like, I actually, I started a world, um, started building a world. What, what is going to happen next? And I wrote that book really, really fast. Um, I have never written a book so fast since. <laughs> and, and it was great. You know, that was that was the beginning. And then um, that was a YA novel. And then I was like, oh, well, I've I've read romance novels, you know, basically since I was born and they should have sex in them. And so then I wrote Nine Rules to Break When Romancing a Rake and I never looked back. I mean, that was... So something I've never asked. So did you write nine rules as fast as the first? Your first. I wrote was- nine and- rules pretty fast, but yeah. it wasn't quite so fast. I wrote the first like 200 pages of nine rules really fast. And then There's I sold it. About- and then once you sell it, they then they yeah. then, then suddenly they, they take a lot longer. <laughs> <laughs> There's something about the first book you write just for yourself without a contract. And it's like this like dizzying, like, I don't it's know. It's magic. I mean, it is. It's like losing yourself in a great meal or something I don't know it's just like gluttony and it's for you and it happens so quickly and yeah it, it it's a, it's like a high or something you know um I think I started writing when I so I read a little YA's the YA market for me when I was actually 10 11 12 wasn't the YA market it is today Mm-hmm. So there wasn't that many YA books. So I read a few and I liked them well enough. And then out of sheer boredom, I picked up a romance novel my grandmother was reading and my mother had read them. I'd seen these around all my life. And I remember falling into that, like a total rabbit hole, like what world is this? And how did I not know this existed? You know, this kind of story, it was just, um, and it was incredible. And I was like, I had no idea books could be like this. And that's when I, yeah. And then after that, I just started writing in my spiral in the back of classrooms, whatever, you know, but I, even that said, I didn't sit down to write my first book till I was like, after I had my first, my daughter, you know, I was like 28 years old and I'm like, Oh, I'll write a book. I'm going to try. Yeah. Yeah. You don't know if you can't, if you don't try. Right. Yeah. Right. 
Um, so what does your writing process look like? Do you come up with characters first or do you come up with a historical or content element first or a plot line first? Where do your, where do your stories come from? Ms. Bev? I'm a pantser, so there's no idea where any of this comes <laughs> from. You know, I may, it may be a piece of history. It may be a kernel of a plot. It may be a kernel of, hmm, let's try this. But for the first probably, I don't know, 50, 60 pages, I don't have a clue what I'm doing. You know, it's, I, I, and I've said this often, it's like I'm, I'm Moses, you know, leading the Israelites through the, through the desert, trying to figure out where the pillar of cloud is that's going to, you know, take me to where I need to go. But eventually, everything sort of falls into place. But it takes a while. That's my process too. And I sort of <clears throat> think I spend a lot of time going, well, what if this? Mm -hmm. And then, you know, noodling it and then calling my friends and saying, well, what if this? <laughs> and then, you know, writing and then writing, you know, uh, I, I, Bev said it much more articulately than I, than I would, but uh, you know, I just write in the darkness and then 70,000 words in, I go, Oh, that's what's happening here. <laughs> yeah. Yep. 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 <laughs> and then the revision is where the magic happens. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Was Erica's like, what is this? And I'm yeah. like, well, I don't know. Erica's for me. <laughs> Erica's Bev's editor. Carrie is mine, and they both. I mean, I'm sure Carrie likes to call me and go. So there's a lot here. <laughs> yeah. Yep. 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 A good editor is worth his or her weight in gold. Yes. Agreed. Yeah. I feel. Yeah. I think when I wade into it, those first hundred. I mean, it is a mess. I am just writing snippets and figure, and then this will be chapter one to this is the opening scene no actually that's not that's chapter three and I'll go back further I mean it is like you're just yes waiting you're like fumbling around blind in a dark room and yeah and beginning with who are these characters and what do they want and why can't they get it right like these are the main these are the starter questions and uh and then sometimes sometimes you're like well no that's not that's not good or not good enough or that's not an effort you know and things evolve and change. Um, I think I'm somewhere between a plotter and a pantser. So I do have some scenes and some ideas in mind. Um, you know, right now I'm, sometimes I'm like writing a story where I realize what's gonna happen. And I'm like, that's later on. That's like the halfway point or one third. It's just taking me so long to get there. I can't figure it out. And then it dawns on me, wait, I'm just starting in there. You know, <laughs> maybe I'm trying to start too soon. Maybe I need to start closer to where I know what's happening. So it's, you know, it's as much as the readers discovering the story, it was like that as we're, as I'm writing it too. Yeah. 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 For me, because I write suspense. So I always know the opening scene, which is usually something really bad has happened. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> something really bad has happened. And now how do I get these characters out of it? How do I fix it? How do, where do they go from here? Um, and so, yeah, I always know where I'm starting and then I let the story unfold from there, but that's usually my starting point. But yeah, my worst nightmare is somebody asking me for a synopsis of the whole book. Cause I'm a pantser too. And I'm like, well, there's two people and they'll end up happy in the end, but bad things will happen first. And that's about all I can tell you right now. <laughs> but Jennifer, I have a question because I don't write suspense, although I do mm -hmm. like tend to write like a sort of there's usually a twist, but it's not this is like quite, an action kind of movie. <laughs> it's not quite the same. Do you know like who did it? Why do you know motivation and like who like what's happened? I do know who before you did start it most of the most of the time, depending on the story, there was one particular story I wrote. And even from the beginning, there was a whole family and nobody was really great in the family. Mm -hmm. um, and they were, things were happening to my main character, the girl, and she had um, her ex that she was like leaning on to get through it. But I didn't know who in the family 
did the bad, bad thing. They all were kind of bad. So I got almost to the very end of the book where I had to reveal it. And I, it took, I had to stop writing. It's the only time I've ever stopped writing for three weeks because I was like, I don't know who did it. I've set this one guy up throughout the whole book, kind of making him the lead bad guy. And I was like, it's just too obvious. And like, why is he bad? Like not all bad people are all bad. Mm -hmm. So in the, I finally figured out that like, he wasn't all bad. It couldn't be all him. And maybe somebody who made you think that they were good-ish wasn't really that great. <laughs> um, but it took me three weeks to figure that. I almost had to call my editor and say, I need to just start over this. I don't know who did it. <laughs> I just don't know. <laughs> um, so... I'm curious also um, if someone was new to either new to the romance genre completely or just a new reader to you, is there a book of yours that you would recommend people start with if they've either never read any, and it might be different for both of these questions I'm realizing, but if they've never read any Ms. Bev Jenkins or if they've never read any Jennifer Ryan, where would you tell them to start? Or if they just never read any romance at all, where would you send them first? For me, I'd send them to Topaz um, because it's fun. It's a road trip. Um, it's, it, 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 it has held up really well to be as old as it is. Mm -hmm. um, it's laugh out loud funny in some parts. And who doesn't like a wagon train of, of, of women <clears throat> going across the country um, and all of the stuff that uh, that involves so so it would be topaz for me i was just talking about topaz today were you yeah because i was talking about road trips that i love and oh okay <laughs> yeah that's a great book i love it it I is a great love book. It. i love it i agree that's the correct answer from you, there you go. <laughs> i know yeah. it's like ask Ask Sarah for us which book it should all be. <laughs> it's the queen of romance recommendations. So yeah. I don't, I always, I always like, I, maybe because I do so many different genres, but I always ask a little bit about them first. Like I want to know perhaps if they are a reader, what else, what have they liked to read before? What are, genres are they coming from? Um, so for me, but so for me, it's particular like, of historical romances, I have two or three that I know to be fan favorites. So I usually go there. Okay. I go, my oldest what title among historicals would be Sins of a Wicked Duke. Um, then I have Virgin of the Rogue is my more recent one that seems to be a fan favorite. And then people really like While You Were Sleeping. You know, it's my like kind of wink on I mean, while the Duke was sleeping. So that it's that wink to the movie. So in historical, that's where I go. In contemporary romance, my Devil's Rock series, I'll just say start there. Start with All Chained Up. And then in my young adult series. <laughs> so again, it's like, wait, do you like paranormal? Do you like contemporary? Because that, yeah. you know, so yeah. I it it's um so my husband said somebody at work knew his wife was a writer and went to my website and they picked out of all the books and this was a man he out of all the books he just told me this yesterday <laughs> every book i've ever written um he picked sins of wicked duke <laughs> sarah <laughs> who it's one of her favorites of mine it's my favorite so I was so like, so he picked my like old school fan favorite <laughs> randomly just randomly listen if you book. like a bathtub <laughs> scene <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. I love it. I yeah. love it. What about you? Um, Go ahead, Jen. Yep. Oh. <laughs> um, I was just going to say for me, um, it, that's really hard because all of my series build off the, the last. Um, you can read any book that I've written as a standalone book. They're all written to just, you just read that book and you're fine. But if, if you really want to, if you really want to be a romance fan or you're really into reading series, um, it's the one thing that I did early on in that every series 
leads to the next series in some way. I always introduce a character or somebody who then, um, you know, goes to the next, it, they just kind of go into the next series in each one. Um, so you can always start with Saved by the Rancher, which was the first book I ever wrote. It's in my Hunted series. But if you're really into like the, the Hunted series is not so much all Western romance. Um, it's really kind of true romantic suspense. And the Cowboys really started with um, the return of Brody McBride um, in my McGrath series. It was the first book there. And that book is actually based loosely on my husband. Um, Brody um, is home from the military and suffers from PTSD. And that was a little bit of my husband's story when we first got married. He was in the military. He came home. Um, and there was, you know, a, a very difficult transition for a while. And so Brody's character is kind of near and dear to my heart because it's a little bit of him and he comes home um, to the girl he left behind. So it was a fun story to write. Um, I, I am the same way that I, I usually ask people, you know, are you more into a light? lighthearted stuff or actiony stuff or you know what kind of tv do you watch yeah. <laughs> um and so but i think i probably would start people with my um baron uncle bastard series which is the series that actually predates house bells um it is all my series like jennifer's like build on each other there's a big giant world the the mclean the mclean of ours <laughs> and so they're all connected um but you can start really anywhere and the but the bare knuckle bastards is a three book series the first there the first one is a retelling of rumpelstiltskin where rumpelstiltskin is the hero and I'm he's also still like obsessed with that series <laughs> <laughs> obsessed <laughs> well, like it's a problem <laughs> i'm so glad i mean they're they're actually they're criminals because of course they are this is yeah. something that i talk about a lot with my therapist um but they're they're <laughs> all criminals <laughs> <laughs> and um, they're you know they're smugglers and the first one like he's really bad and he wants vengeance and she is the instrument of his vengeance and then the second one he's like really very very big sweetheart but also like a bare knuckle best um, bare knuckle boxer and just leads with his fists and poor baby he's very sweet and then the third one is an anti-hero and i often start people there because i think like if you're into action movies where you know beautiful people blow things up bare knuckle bastards is going to be for you mm -hmm. and it will naturally lead you into the hell's bell series where um it's the women who are blowing things up mm -hmm. so cannot wait for imogen's story Oh, she's chaos. <laughs> <laughs> That's book three. It'll be out next summer. It's going to be so. great. Looking forward to it. Um, so how has the romance genre changed while you have been in it? You've all been writing for quite some time. How have you seen the genre change over time? Bev, that well, sounds like you. <laughs> I was say, that sounds like a Miss Bev question. Right. <laughs> well... Back in the old days, uh, <laughs> I think one of the best changes has been opening the, the genre to um, everyone. Uh, love is love. Back then, um, there was no LGBTQ. Mm -hmm. There was you know, the, the black writers in the big trade, in the big companies, you could count on maybe one hand. So that has been, for me, um, the romance now represents more of the world. Because um, everybody, you know, everybody loves. And it, it's taken a while for, for romance to get to this point. And, and we're still trying to turn the ship around, mm -hmm. but um, I never imagined it would be this diverse, for lack of a better word, um, when I first started. And consent is now sexy. You yes. Know? Consent is now sexy. It was not sexy back then. It was, I will rape you and you will love me, you know, back in the, when we first started. So. Um, I've seen some changes. I've seen some changes, and they've been 
they've been great changes. Um, that our WAA has blown up um, is not a good thing in the sense of having a trade group to represent us with problematic issues. Mm -hmm. But um, it was something that had to happen, I think, in order to to get to get us where we even are now. So, so those are my what three, three mm -hmm. big changes um, from somebody who started writing when the earth was cooling. Um, <laughs> yeah. I think for me yeah. um, in my books, the one thing that I, I I didn't see in the early books that I do in my books, um, I put mental health, um, you know, front and center in a lot of my books. I talk about characters who have PTSD, people who are struggling right. and looking right. for help and needing support from the people closest to them um so i do you know think that readers like to see that and i hope that gives them hope that you know um that there is help out Good there point. for them too they can get a happy ending in their life as well um they don't have to struggle all the time they can you know ask for help receive it and be um the person they want to be for the the love in their life yeah they don't have to be perfect Yes. Don't yeah, they don't perfect. have to be perfect. Yeah, nobody's perfect. That's a great point, Jen. Great point. Mm -hmm. I think the pool is just so much bigger now, too. I mean, in, and it's like impossible to think. I signed my first contract or I put out my first book. There were no ebook, there was no ebook yeah. rights in that contract. And so I have just like, I just like slid in the door before ebooks exploded and and that all started happening and independent publishing like self-publishing people being right. able to write whatever book they want that centers them themselves their kinks their identities yeah. their whole world view everything um now it they can do it they can find a home for it they can find their readers um it used to be kind of everyone had to read the you know the common denominator of books because yeah. those were the books that could fit on the shelf. And now the shelf is ever expanding. Yeah. Um, and that is amazing. And also like, I think we can't, especially now, like this week feels, I don't know if you all feel this way, but it feels like this week is a totally different release week than like any release week I've ever had before, mm -hmm. because like the, the entire world seems to be reading romance in like all different spaces mm -hmm. and when you walk I was in Barnes and Noble this week and I was like there's so much romance just everywhere on the tables on the you know and there are there's lots to be said about you know why that is and how it's working and what it all means but um man we are it, for a long time it was hard to get people to pay attention to us and now it feels like it's hard it's hard to get air if you're not you know in romance yeah yeah Sophie? Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, I can only agree with everything that's been said. Um, I don't know. I just remember starting out, especially in the historical, like there seemed to be, if not <coughs> spoken, at least unspoken, some rules and expectations about what historicals are or what they should be. And I, I just think that's not the case anymore. Um, yeah. I mean, maybe like I said, I've always wanted to write a female blacksmith book. Well, apparently it took it's now that it happened, you know, 2022, where I want to write heroines that are different and they're, they're working heroines. Not every book I'm going to write is a Duke or, you know, like, but it, it, I feel like there is more freedom and maybe a little more control on, you know, I mean, if you want to write and tell a certain story, I mean, there's publishing, there's indie publishing, there's a way, you know, to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah Cause there was no indie back when I started at all, yeah. you know, and the process has changed too. Right, right. I mean, digital and being <laughs> online and not having to print out everything and put everything in a box oh, yeah. and sending it to New York. And yes. you know, lots of, we talked about that on Faded Mates, you know, lots of white out and, you know, <laughs> cut and paste. Remember actually, white out? Oh, <laughs> It was definitely cut and paste. You know, yeah. you had to 
tape your stuff on the ends of pages and fold right. it shit up. And right. Put Think it in. about it. Bev, you could write something and it could be up tomorrow. Like I know. if you want to. That's just, it's just mind boggling. And I, I mean, I think where it really impacted me, I think, you know, Jennifer Armitrout, her first indie, the one, the one that like she decided to do, she was still, she writing traditionally, but I remember her telling me like she wrote it like in a, she got the idea and then wrote it in a whirlwind and then put it up a week later. That's just crazy. It's, it's, it's amazing. It's amazing. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know what it, else it, what? we, we, uh, and, and I readers, romance writers and romance readers have always had a really remarkable relationship, like always had a really strong community. Mm. Um, but now it feels like act, the sort of community of romance is so accessible for everyone who wants to be a part of it. Yeah. Um, and that's really lovely. In a, and I think it's something that's really special to us. Like there aren't a ton of, the other genres don't get that kind of relationship with their readers. And I mean, Bev, you, you're the one who was, you told me that you used to send a, a newsletter. Is that right? A yeah. paper newsletter? Yeah, we sent paper newsletters. Wow. Um, and we would get our addresses at our book signings and you'd have your little notebook and you'd tell people to, you know, put their address uh, mm -hmm. in the notebook and then you'd mm -hmm. take that home and you'd do your newsletter and you'd use the addresses to mm -hmm. stay in wow. touch with, with people. And like you said, I don't know if other genres did that, but that was, you know, common in romance yeah. back uh -huh. then. So, yeah. We so. lead the way. We always lead the way. We're on the cutting mm -hmm. edge. Mm -hmm. We were the first people to use the the e-readers. We, you know, we were the, mm -hmm. you know, the first out there doing the indie stuff. Mm -hmm. um, romance for the win. Yeah. <laughs> One of the things I've talked with in each of these series um, with other authors is how, you know, yes, there are rules for romance, but it's really just it has to end happily. Like it has to focus on that couple on, on a couple's journey and it has to end happily but you can write whatever you want I mean there is a if you like westerns if you like sci-fi if you like historical if you time period there is romance for everybody um, which I think isn't necessarily the case in other genres either they're a little bit I feel like there are actually more even though romance landia often gets slammed for having these like you know it has to have a happy ending and you don't argue with that I don't know that other genres have that flexibility to write every single other genre as long as they have a happy ending. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's why they're putting romance in all their stuff. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Everybody's trying to put romantic elements mm -hmm. uh, in everything because, you know, I don't, I, I, they're looking for the readers. Mm -hmm. you know, and the readers are heavily on, uh, on our side of the, of the river. <laughs> so... Uh, <laughs> yeah we'll take it mm -hmm. for we'll sure it. for sure uh let's see what do you find to be the most challenging thing about writing romance naming mm -hmm. characters <laughs> <laughs> you've had a bad week jenny <laughs> me I usually know like you know because I usually write brothers so I usually know the three guys names and then you know like um I'll pick the girls names you know to go with them but then all the secondary characters and stuff there's a lot of like xx cc dd just like placeholders and books where I'm like the waitress whatever her name is <laughs> yeah so yeah naming characters is like a pain and, and it has to be right that only gets worse the more books you have too because you're like wow you know I mean really it's like naming children you're like I gotta it do is. I like this does it feel like him yeah I use placeholders a lot um I mean really it's just you have a deadline and you got to get it done you know like yeah. finding you know it's I wish it were as easy to come up it's easy to come up with the ideas it's harder to write them down you know to get it on yeah. you know from here into the into the laptop takes time yeah. and 
sometimes I can get bogged down. I try not to, it's like, I just try to look at the task for the day, right? Whatever, just write this chapter, write this thousand words. Because if you, I lift my head and look too far out on the horizon and I'm like, oh, I have 80,000 words. I got to write. No, then it's just mm-hmm. overwhelming and daunting, okay. right? You, just, yeah. you take your task day by day or week yeah. by week. Yeah. How do you eat an elephant one bite at a time, right? That's yeah. it. Yeah. That's and, it. For, and for me, it's to not write the same story every time. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, I know that you know, there are people out there who do that, you know, they just slap new names and, you know, yeah. stay with the formula and all of that. But, you know, I, I don't want to do that. You know, I want to give, and I think we're all focused on that too, is yes. that we want to give our readers a different, you know, for lack of a better word, flavor mm-hmm. for mm-hmm. each book. And that's difficult. Mm-hmm. Um, you want it to be fresh. You want it to, <clears throat> to be engaging. You want it to be memorable mm-hmm. um and that's hard mm-hmm. that's hard mm-hmm. for sure yeah that's a really good point mm-hmm. um the uh, you know i i think that there is i think especially when readers because you you know readers come to you for a specific thing right like they know what they're gonna get when they read a mclean novel or a jenkins novel or you know ryan or jordan and um and so it's that what Sophie always says to me is like exactly the same, but completely different. Right. <laughs> it is. Exactly. And there I, is something they want in a Beverly Jenkins novel, right? You want to do that, but you got to make it different. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's so yeah. like, yeah, keep your voice the same, keep doing what they love. Yeah. And, and, you know, and we, you asked which books we recommend. I often sit back and I look at my bookshelf of all the books I've written and the ones that stand out that I hear the most about, I just try to pay attention. It's sort of like, you know, having this moment where I commune with myself before I start a book and I'm like, okay, which ones really resonated and thinking about it and thinking about why they did, mm, you know, just yeah. to kind of get in that right headspace before you start the next yeah. project. But, you know, don't you, uh, maybe it's just me, but I feel like I, when, when they do resonate, like when, when there's one that really hits, mm-hmm. you're sort of like, oh, that hit for me too. That yeah. felt, oh, that yeah. felt really special for me too. You did, yeah. you knew it. Yeah. 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 yeah, and trying to do that and find that feeling while you're writing is oh, not impossible. always easy. No. <laughs> exactly. Because the yeah. attention yeah. in your head, head. yeah, the, the, that thing in your head that you're like, this is amazing. And then you read it on the page and you're like, oh, I didn't get it yet. It's not this there is yet. garbage. Like, yeah. <laughs> Start over. Someone's going to fire me. <laughs> yeah, cut this out, cut that out, dump you're this. Like, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I find that sometimes the hardest or like I'll get an er editorial note and that's always my thought oh the intention in here didn't hit Mm -hmm. the page right Right. yeah something happened between here and here yeah this space yeah Yeah. because with this you know with with Raven you know my last couple books have been pretty heavy you know and I wanted to do something a little bit lighter Mm -hmm. you know so like you know Sophie said I went back and I looked at all the old titles Mm-hmm. And 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 try to figure out what the magic was mm-hmm. in those books, and and tried to put it in into Raven. And I had I had a whole lot of fun, mm-hmm. you know, writing this book. So, yeah. Well, there's something really special about the books where you know we, Sophie and I are, are good friends, and we talked about this a lot. But you know, that the back cover copy of your book when it's sort of like. And she has to go steal a copy of the Declaration of Independence. <laughs> and you're like, this is amazing. Yep. <laughs> like, already, I know it's going to be kind of bonkers. The I know it's time. like, it's national treasure, but make it Bev yes. Jenkins. Right. Yes. yes. With and, a bag of mice. I mean, you know. Yes. Right. right? And so you sort of have this moment where I think, and I think, you know, um, your question was, what's the hardest part? Right. And, um. I think that the hardest part often for me is um, being convincing myself that when you're writing the scary thing or the bonkers thing or the thing that you're afraid people just won't buy or you're, the thing that you're afraid no one will believe um, is the right path, right? Yeah. Like 
I, I think yeah. a lot about when you get to the point of the book and you say like, that's scary. Like if I go down this path, I don't know if I'm going to be able to hold it all together and like make it a book. Yeah. Invariably, that means that's the path, right? You have yeah. to go down that path. Yeah. And yeah. that's not a romance thing. That's a writing thing. Yeah. Um, but you know, that's the way you get to, she has to steal the Declaration of Independence, right? Yeah. right? right. I mean- Right scared. Yeah. Right, right scared. And <laughs> that's where the fun comes too for the reader. Cause the reader's like, what is happening? This is bananas. And also how is it all going to work out? Yeah. You right. know, and there you are. And yeah, sometimes, are go ahead. I, I'm in that moment though, where I'm like, wait, plausibility here. Oh, I want it to happen. I want this scene to happen. Forget about the plausibility because I'm going with the fact that the reader's going to want it to happen too. Like, yeah. Yeah. bring the bonkers. They want it to happen. They're going to suspend. It. Yes. Yeah. 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 That's what I was going to yeah. say. Is that's going to inevitably be the scene that like the reader gloms onto. Yeah. And, like, this is phenomenal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I never expected it. Or like that's the the memorable part that's going to stick with them. Yeah. We, we read to escape and to live something else that maybe isn't as plausible put it in there. I want to see, I want to see twins being mauled by gorillas. I want to, <laughs> like, wanna... that's, that's a Lorraine Heath reference. That's a Lorraine Heath reference. That is a Lorraine Heath, but I read it years and years ago <laughs> and it stuck with me. It's still one of the most bonkers plot elements I've ever read. Like, oh, amazing. Yeah. where do you go from there? And it's still this just beautiful, heart-wrenching Lorraine Heath. But it starts with one of the brothers being mauled to death by a gorilla. And it's just never, <laughs> I have sold that book so many times. Just oh my that. God. <laughs> we needed we need Lorraine here. Yeah. <laughs> um, so speaking of selling books and bookstores, uh, this past Saturday was Bookstore Romance Day, which is one of my favorite days of the year where uh, indie bookstores get to celebrate and promote the romance genre. I know several of you participated in different virtual events and things. Um, do you feel like having that day, this was I think the third annual, what sort of impact do you think that that is having on the genre? Do you think that's helping to grow the the genre in the way that it's hoping to? You know, I, I do have an opinion on this because of course I do. Um, and I think it's yeah. great. Like I think in theory, Bookstore Romance Day is awesome. Um, what I fear is that it makes it so that a lot of bookstores to can choose to say, well, like, we do it that one day, so we're not going to celebrate romance the th other 364 days a year. Um, and I want that. I want, I want, and I think what's cool about it is it's bringing attention to romance, to bookstores all across the country to say, you have romance readers in your community. Yeah. Um, I went to a bookstore on Saturday that does not traditionally carry romance we there were 90 people in the room with me and Tessa Bailey oh, and wow. it was amazing and my hope is that when we left those that store was like this is awesome let's yeah. let's bring yeah. in let's <clears throat> cultivate this community of yeah. romance readers mm -hmm. you know yeah. over the years and I know everyone in this group can can test can sort of speak to this over the years, it, it has been really difficult to convince bookstores that we are here, we are a legion, and that um, we don't buy our books alone. We buy our books in addition to all the other books right. that you have in your right. store. Yeah. Um, so that's my yeah. feeling on Bookstore Romance Day. Yeah. I love it. I love it. Yeah. I just want it to be Bookstore Romance all the time. Right. Yes. Yeah. My feeling is, is, is it growing are the number of bookstores that are carrying romance, is it helping increase those numbers? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, because we got a lot of stores that don't. Yep. You know, uh, yeah. Jen put together a, uh, a map a couple of years ago of, of all of the romance friendly independents. We shouldn't need a map. Mm -hmm. You know, we should be able to, you know, go in. So I'm hoping that, and like Sarah said, that they'll start to embrace romance all the time mm -hmm. as opposed to just that one Saturday in 
whatever month yeah. we're in, what, August, you know? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. we'll see what happens in five years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, maybe maybe the ones that are the non-embracers will learn something from the day because I certainly live in a community, in an area of Houston where the, um, where I, you know, Katie Budger Books is right down the road from me. And it's just a store that has, the booksellers there read the genre and that's so important, you mm -hmm. know? They read it, they stock it, they promote it. I would say that store is almost 70% 70 per, 70 romance, you know? But um, they're aware of what they have, you know, there that, you know, that the readers are there. It's a gold mine. It's waiting, you know, yeah. um, and the community they built in. And I, I just, when I went into, I do pre-orders through my local Indian. and I was just in the back signing stock and I could hear the women coming in and talking. Yeah. These were veterans. These were women that this is their store, you know, they would, they came with like two or three together, you know, they travel in packs and tribes and then they know the booksellers. So that's the kind of community. Well, that, romance readers you know. are a lot of fun. Yes, yes they put, are. Put yes, 50 yeah. of us in a room. Not only are we going to have a great <laughs> right. time. Well, you know this, everybody is, you guys are great about romance. I should say you're yep. terrific. Thank and uh, anytime, anytime you put us in a room, we're going to have fun. And then my favorite thing is when then they come through the line to get signed to get their book signed and invariably there's somebody who came alone and they were sitting next to somebody who also came alone but now they're friends right so yeah. we're also just like matchmaking as we right. go it's part yeah. of the job yeah 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 yeah, yeah. yeah. I yeah. have I know several romance readers that there's a pair that stood in line for me one year and those two are best friends now. Like they, one of them went and took a, one of them's from Canada and the other one lives in Texas. And the one in Texas went up and stayed with her. Like they've become such good yeah, friends. I love it. Like, I love it. Just, mates. Those are just two romance <laughs> readers in line together, you know? I love it. Yeah. I know all of our locations carry romance. I can't speak to the other locations because I obviously am always in Grand Rapids, but I think we probably have more shelf talkers per square inch of shelf space in our romance section than we do in other sections because so many of us read and love the genre along with all the other genre. We can recommend it around the store, but those are the ones that we just want to sort of squee about um, mm -hmm. and, and get people excited about. So love y'all for that. That's very, yeah. very fun. Um, what section, so thinking of the two main characters, Characters in your new release, um, if they were to go to a bookstore together, <laughs> what section of the bookstore would they each be found or most likely to browse in? Hmm. Lynn is definitely in the romance section. She, mm -hmm. She's like, yeah, she's hanging out and buying 50 books. <laughs> Hunt my law guy. I think he might be wondering what she's reading and want to get in on that. He's, you know, He's all about whatever sin wants at this point. <laughs> he wants to protect her. So he's going to be right near wherever she is. So Exactly. Yeah. She's not going anywhere without him, but yeah. But, yeah, but I think also sin because she's kind of a, you know, wild at heart, a free spirit and, and just her own person is so happy in her own skin. Mm -hmm. I think that rubs off on him and he feels like he can like, you know, relax and, and he's not out to change her at all. He just, you know, is like, you're so cool. I just want to hang out with you all the time, even though we're a little different. Um, but yeah, so I think he'd be hanging out with her in the romance section and she'd be talking dirty to him about whatever she's like reading in the book. So that would be sin. <laughs> Love, it. Love it. My lady blacksmith, she would have to be, you know, she's, trying to start a business and keep it going she'd be all functional like mm -hmm. my hero my scoundrel he'd be reading he'd be like in the fiction he'd read a romance yeah. <laughs> um my heroine would be in true crime yeah. she would be looking for a new a new grifting adventure mm -hmm. and he's a tailor and a businessman so he'd probably be in the in the business section or the mm -hmm. the section on you know clothing <laughs> <laughs> um yeah my heroine would probably be in mystery or yeah she she also she's she's busy she's busy trying to figure out you know how to how to solve how to solve a mystery mm -hmm. um and my hero 
he's like a pretty vocal dude in parliament. So he's probably in non, he's in nonfiction. He's probably in like social justice or like, um, you know, uh, history, but like an interesting history, a sort of sense of, you know, revolutionaries through history. Mm-hmm. And, um, and what he hasn't figured out is that speeches are very pretty, but he needs yeah. her to, to prove to him that action often speaks louder. So, mm-hmm. yeah. Wonderful. Well, I sort of lost track of time because this conversation has been so much fun. So I've got a couple little sort of wrap up questions before we go. I would love to know what each of you are currently reading or most excited to read next. Um, I'm not supposed to be reading. I'm supposed to be writing. (laughs) But I am reading. uh, We won't tell. (laughs) We won't tell. I'm reading City of Brass. And then, um, yeah, I mean, that's like nine thousand million pages yeah in those three three volumes mm-hmm. and then the new patricia briggs mm-hmm. moon shadow moon soul something just dropped the other days yep. so that's calling me from my kindle and i'm trying to put my earbuds in and not hear it because i'm not <laughs> supposed to be writing but, you're so disciplined uh, <laughs> we'll see um I just finished uh, Sally Thorne's Angelica Frankenstein Makes Her Match, which is... That's on my next list. I mean, listen, it is so bananas. (laughs) I mean, I love... Look, Sally is hysterically funny. You know, when we when we make a when we talk about rom coms, so many of us are talking about rom coms right now. Mm-hmm. Honestly, Sally should just be at the top of every list. Like mm-hmm. she is, she is the great. I really believe she's one of the greatest rom com voices of our generation of writers. Um, it this book is about uh, it's a retelling of Frankenstein from the perspective of a character who did not exist in the novel in <laughs> Shelley's novel. Um, Victor Frankenstein in in Sally's version has a sister named Angelica who is literally making herself a man oh, and it I begins it. I love it they are in the morgue looking at cadavers I mean it is so if that squicks you out look this book probably isn't for you but if you are like that is insane how does that work this book is absolutely going to work for you it is hysterically I mean I laughed out loud in the first chapter multiple times it's real wild y'all like really (laughs) wild so definitely worth it I did not know how it was going to end which is all I asked for in romance like I know they're going to get together but how on earth is this going to all work out and it delivers on every level and but um this morning I started my friend Adriana Herrera's on the hustle which comes out in October so you can pre-order it now from Schuler or somewhere else um and it is really great the heroine um is her job is uh well she wants her job to be right now like her dream job is to be an interior decorator who turns bedrooms um in who helps people decorate their bedroom in the style of their favorite book okay so so like if your favorite book is uh game of thrones she's gonna help you figure out like how to read i don't know red wedding you're oh god no (laughs) right (laughs) but you know what i mean Um, yeah 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 so that's her like dream job, but um, to pay the bills, she is the assistant to the personal assistant to an Olympic swimmer, a former Olympic swimmer, now real estate magnate. Um, and he is terrible in every way. He is just cold and, um, you know, demanding and so hot also. And um, she just can't deal. She's like, you know what? I've had enough. I like I have I've had enough with you and your whole attitude. And she quits and she pieces out to Dallas and he melts down without her and has to go get her and this is one of my like Ugh, I want my that. favorite what? tropes it's That's called like on the hustle. hustle I want that whole thing right there yeah yes right. yeah I'm, I'm sitting an email soon All frustrated right. man is my favorite flavor as someone said <laughs> I like the grump. I, yes I want the grump yeah bring him to his knees oh. Um, I'm reading an early read of Anna Maria and the Fox by uh, Liana De La Rosa. Oh, yeah. It's, uh, it's the first of a series about three Mexican heiresses that, uh, I guess, they flee uh, Mexico to Britain 
I think it's in the 1860s. So, you know, there's turmoil and they, they're, they're fleeing the turmoil and they're landing smack dab on top of London society. So it's really good. Really, it's different, it's fresh take, fresh eyes. Um, and yeah, I'm excited. You know, and, and, you know, when you dive into that story where, oh, it's these three sisters and you already know, you're getting to know the sisters and you're, you're kind of eyeballing who the next heroes are also gonna be and you're getting totally, I'm already hooked to the world. So I'm invested. I'm ready for book two, whatever which steps I'm like messaging, which sister's next, you know, so. <laughs> well, I have done nothing but writing this year. I, I just finished writing my third book of this year and I have another one due January 1st. So I literally have to start writing the next book wow. <laughs> immediately. But this arrived for me to Ooh. read. read. <laughs> <laughs> this is my little gift to myself. <laughs> I love it. Thank I, you. The Bare Knuckle Bastards are like my favorite all-time series. So yeah, I'm very excited to read book two of The Hell's Bells. It's right here waiting for me. So I get to read this before I start writing my next book. <laughs> I love it. Preach yourself. It. Thank you, you friend. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. I have to sneak away to grab the book because it's on my bed. It's right here, Sarah. <laughs> I'm waiting. <laughs> I'm about to start um, Small Town Big Magic. Um, it's by Hazel Beck. It's about an indie bookstore owner who suddenly discovers that she has magic and her whole town has magic. Um, and also she has feelings for her childhood best friend who's a grumpy farmer. Um, so I just... <laughs> A grumpy farmer. <laughs> yep. I yeah that's my my next one and then right after that is Angelica Frankenstein meets makes her mad because I can't wait yeah um all right I know we've touched on a little bit of this but last basically last question is what can we are uh your large group of fans what can we expect from each of you next if you're able to share what's coming next from you I am finishing book 11 for the Blessing series. Uh, we've had to shelve it for two years mm -hmm. and the readers have been very, very considerate and they have not cussed me or cut me or any of that. So <laughs> um, I have a, another month or so to get it done. So it'll be out in October of 23. It's a Christmas book. Oh, a wonderful. A Christmas to remember. Love it. So for me, I have book three of my Wyoming Wild series. Um, after Hunt's book, The Last Brother, of course, The Last Wild Brother, Max, um, gets a story. It's called Max Wild's Cowboy Heart. Um, and Max um, gets a second chance at love with his very first love after she witnesses a murder and he's to be put in protective custody and so she comes to stay at his ranch in, in FBI protective custody and bad things ensue and they fall back in love um, all the ladies around these they men don't know about. <laughs> all the ladies around these men are in danger I love it they're in danger she's the one in danger this time um, and then um, after that in Hunt's book I introduce even more wilds the wild cousins and they own the uh, dark horse dive bar so I'm going to be writing the very first dark horse dive bar book um next so fans um, will from Wyoming wild to the dark horse dive bar <laughs> I love it can't wait can't wait Sophie oh I um so the do kind of going to be a total of four books. I've started the fourth one now. So that, uh, so following the schedule falls hard, following my Lady Blacksmith book. Um, the next one will be out around this same time next year. In March, I have a new series starting though in historical romance. Here's the little covers, see? So very pretty. So Ooh. it's The Scandalous Ladies of London. The first book is uh, called The Countess. So the series uh, centers around a group of friends, their wives, you know, daughters, mistresses uh, of like really London's high society. So there's lots of drama and shade, disgustingly rich and not so rich. Like it's just very, um, just 
high drama and I'm trying to channel the bonkers in every single one of those books. So, and of course the romance. So the first one will be out in March. And I think I know which one the second one's going to be yet. Well, you know, we'll figure it out. (laughs) I don't have to write that yet. I got to get through the fourth Duke Hunt book. So. (laughs) No, no. Well, thank you all so much for taking some time to talk to me tonight. I know it's been a busy week with Books to Romance Day and Release Week, and I just, I'm really grateful for your time and honored that I get to meet all of you virtually and speak with you and share my love of the romance genre with your love of the romance genre. I'm, I'm really very, very grateful. So thank you all. Thanks, Thanks so much for thank having you. us. Thanks. Yeah. For Bye. Having. Bye, everyone. Thanks Bye, for everybody. Bye. Bye. Thanks Take for having care. Us. Catch us next week on Rendezvous with Romance. Uh, We'll be talking Wallflowers and Scoundrels with Lenore Bell and Ava Lee on Thursday, September 29. So see see you then. Bye, everybody. Bye.